welcome back to Speaker's Corner. We're here for the last Speaker's Corner of today. Uh, I'm your host, Catherine Jacks from sciencenordic.com and beatandscape.dk. And uh, Speaker's Corner is here with a range of presentations, poster pitches, informal discussions. So do be prepared with questions that you have for our speakers. What's going to happen today is uh, we've got two speakers here. They're here to talk about cocaine addiction. Each speaker will take it in turns and then we'll have a Q&A at the end. So do think of some interesting questions that you want to ask our speakers. And we have a microphone just here at the front. So any questions, just come forward, stand at the microphone and you'll have a chance to ask questions at the end. So here today we have Christian Lucia. If I said that correctly, yeah. Uh, from the University of Geneva, uh, Christian was the first to observe the long-lasting effects of drugs like cocaine on the brain, I think is fair to say, and he's developing new ways of reversing some of those changes. Is that correct, Christian? And then next up, we're going to talk to Ulrike Gether from the University of Copenhagen, who also studies um, cocaine addiction effects on the brain and also uh, some slightly different ways of trying to reverse some of those changes. So Christian, first up, take it away. Thank okay, you. So I'm glad to be here. Is the microphone on? No, you don't hear anything. No? Okay, good. So um, once we get started, I would like to give you a little brief overview on some of the clinical aspects that were important and still are for the research that we do in our lab. So for us, addiction is a disease that evolves in several steps. There is an initiation phase that is typically followed by a controlled consumption phase, sort of a honeymoon phase, where people can use drugs, whether it's cocaine and other drugs, without losing control. However, there is a moment where there is an automatic consumption of the drug, and that may lead to a compulsive use despite negative consequences. And it is this, what I've written here in red, that is, in fact, the WHO definition of drug addiction. Compulsive use of a substance despite negative consequences. We know that some people can actually become abstinent, they can withdraw, but we also know that even after prolonged periods of withdrawal, there is a risk to relapse. So two basic questions in the field of drug addiction, people who study neurobiology is, how do you transition from the controlled consumption to the compulsive consumption? And what is going on in the brain once we relapse? So in the last 15 years, my lab has been interested in these questions. And in the next slide, we have a simplified version of sort of the overarching hypothesis that has guided our experimental work. So we believe Everything starts when addictive substances activate a particular system in the brain, which is the mesolimbic reward system that you see here in the sagittal section of a mouse brain, has its origin in the ventral tegmental area, and projects through a dopamine projections to the accumbens, the prefrontal cortex, and many other regions. We then believe that this inappropriate increase of dopamine triggers specific forms of synaptic plasticity that eventually alter the activity of circuit of motivated behavior. In the end, we have then these drug adaptive behaviors such as relapse, compulsion, and resistance to punishment. So we have tested this at different stages. So the initial question obviously is, how do you explain that these chemically very diverse substances that each has a molecular target of its own could have a common effect on the brain? And we believe that this can actually be condensed on this uh, minimal circuit of the ventral tegmental area that I have blown up here, where you see that on top of the projection neurons, you also have GABA neurons that control the activity of the dopamine neurons that in that very simple circuit, you have essentially three cellular mechanisms that drive the increase of dopamine. Nicotine can directly depolarize the cells. Cocaine, amphetamine, ecstasy interact with the re-uptake uh, uh, system. 
So that is an indirect way of increasing dopamine. And finally, there is a third group that works also indirectly because it targets primarily the GABA neurons, inhibits them, and that then leads to disinhibition and more dopamine increase. We actually know that this is not only the mechanism through that this works, but the direct activation, the direct stimulation of the dopamine neurons as such is sufficient to drive the reinforcement and the drug adaptive behavior. So we were able to show that by transfecting channel rhodopsin into the VTA dopamine neurons and giving the control of the light stimulation to the mouse through that lever here. And you see that each time the mouse presses the lever, the blue laser comes on, activates the dopamine neurons, and these mice, they don't do much else over the time session that we had them in the cage. So if after two hours we wouldn't take them out of the cage, they wouldn't eat, they wouldn't drink, and they would probably die quickly but very happily. So uh, beyond that initial stage, we believe it is important to understand that there must be sort of a drug uh, trace that is found in the brain. And we and others have identified drug-evoked synaptic plasticity as such a correlate. That is, in other words, at the time where the drug has actually been cleared from the system, there are specific forms of synaptic transmission that can be observed ex vivo. And so we have spent several years now to characterize that type of drug-evoked synaptic plasticity and then in a second step try to relate this to the drug adaptive behavior. So the blueprint of a typical experiment that we do in our lab goes like this. We have uh, adaptive behavior. We then look ex vivo at identified synapses for this uh, drug evoked synaptic plasticity. We try to understand its induction and expression mechanism, not just as an academic exercise, but because we would like to use that then to develop reversal strategies in vitro that we then can use in vivo to see how that affects the behavior. And we've done this now in several projects. I'm not gonna go into the details because it actually is becoming rather complex. Uh, tomorrow we'll have a symposium and I'll talk about two types of drug evoked synaptic plasticity that we have been able to link to specific components of the drug addiction process. So the blue ones here on a drug evoked synaptic plasticity of excitatory transmission and in the red one here, a uh, drug evoked synaptic plasticity on GABA transmission. So please, tomorrow afternoon, come to the symposium. I'll give you the details on that. So it seems that there is indeed, there is a powerful way to interfere with drug ad adaptive synaptic plasticity. And that then is, of course, first done with the goal to establish links of causality between these types of changes and the drug adaptive behavior in order to better understand which circuits are involved. But of course, you can take this idea also beyond the academic research and ask yourself whether that would be, uh, had a possibility to affect translation. And so over the last uh, three or four years, we have started to establish a line of translational research where we believe that deep brain stimulation could be a technique that allows us to interfere very specifically with circuits that matter in motivated behavior and also drug addiction. And we have published in last year a proof of principle study where we carried out deep brain stimulation according to an optogenetic protocol in mice to show that this reverses specific forms of drug adaptive plasticity. So I believe this is something one can uh, take further and that this may actually then lead to new forms of deep brain stimulation, a technique that we can readily use in humans. So taken together, we believe drug evoked synaptic plasticity is sort of the initial change and uh, that this uh, has then bearings onto the drug adaptive uh, behavior 
we can interfere with that optogenetically, and once we know exactly what we need to do, we can then maybe emulate this by doing a deep brain stimulation protocol for the benefit of people with addiction. And last but not least, these are our funding sources, mainly the ERC and the Swiss National Science Foundation. Thank you very much. Thanks, Christian. And whilst Christian just has his microphone changed and Ulrich finishes writing his slides, we'll be uh, ready to go on. So just a quick reminder, it's Ulrich Gether from the University of Copenhagen, who also studies the effects of cocaine on the brain and is also developing uh, ways of trying to reverse some of these changes. So Ulrich will give us an introduction into some of his work. And whilst we're just waiting for the microphone to be changed, I'll just give a quick plug to tomorrow. We have poster sessions, uh, poster pitches, and three-minute thesis. So if you are presenting a poster, go online to sciencenordic.com to sign up for a three-minute poster pitch. We still have a couple of slots available, I think, so do give that a go. And I think we're nearly there. Perhaps have a little bit of technical assistance if needed. <laughs> So once again, Ulrich will speak for about 10 minutes, and then afterwards we'll have a chance for some questions and answers. And the microphone is at the front, so towards the end of Ulrich's talk, do start lining up if you have questions or just wave your hand frantically. I have my glasses on today, so I should be able to, to see you. Okay, so when, when Ulrich is dressed, we're good to go. <laughs> Thanks, Ulrich. Uh, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to, to speak here. Uh, this will be a very different angle, more from the molecular perspective. Um, no sound? So just need to be better. Is that better? From a different and a, and a molecular perspective, we have in the lab been interested in uh, the dopamine system, and actually the entire monoaminergic system for, for a number of years. And in particular, as I said, uh, we have uh, dopamine, which is, as many of you of, of course know, a very important neurotransmitter in the brain. But one thing that always is fascinating me is the fact that we only have around 400,000 dopaminergic neurons, yet we have 100 billion neurons in the brain. Nevertheless, this transmitter is, is very critically important for many, many different functions. Uh, and as you also know, we have different pathways and these pathways, because, uh, sorry, the neurons have very, very long projections, enabling to take care of so many different functions, even though there are so few of them. The two major functions is uh, the, the control of, of movements, uh, which is the microstriatal neurons, and the second very important function is uh, the mesolimbic and mesocortical neurons, which very briefly is the uh, brain's reward system. We also know that this function of the dopamine system leads to disease like Parkinson's disease. We have degeneration of nigrostriatal neurons uh, as well as the mesolimbic and mesocortical neurons are very important, in particular in addiction, but also in tightly related diseases like ADHD, schizophrenia, and autism. Our interest, and that's what I'm going to focus on for the rest of my talk, is actually the target for cocaine, and that is the dopamine transporter. And it's a really critical protein in terms of regulating dopamine homeostasis. It's sitting in the presynaptic membrane, as you can see here, and acts as a protein that, first of all, removes the dopamine from the extracellular space, ensuring that's not too much dopamine available to act on the postsynaptic and presynaptic receptors. Uh, secondly, and which is also very important to understand the important role of this protein in homeostasis is that it's critical for maintaining the pool of, of dopamine and if we have a knock after the dopamine transfer there will be a reduction of more than 90% in the total pool of dopamine uh, in, the, in the brain. Not only is it physiologically important but as I alluded to it is very very important uh, as the target for uh, cocaine, cocaine interact with the dopamine transporter, binds with high affinity, resulting in a very rapid rise in the extracellular dopamine concentration. 
uh, which underlies the strongly addictive properties of this uh, particular molecule. It also interacts with the serotonin and norepinephrine transporters, yet the addictive properties are believed to rely on its interaction with the dopamine transporter. What's, in, what's interesting is that we also have drugs targeting the, the DAD that we actually use in normal treatment, which can sound like a paradox, like methylphenidate, which is a commonly used drug against uh, ADHD, also modafinil, as well as amphetamine. But what our research we've done over many years has suggested that the mode of interaction and the way they interact with the transporter is very critical for the stimulatory response. So the ability of cocaine to rapidly distribute in the brain and cause a very rapid increase in the extracellular dopamine concentration is the key to the stimulatory properties and the addictive properties. If you just have inhibitors like methylphenidate or modafinil, also called atypical inhibitors, that are not nearly as stimulatory because simply the way they act, interact with the transporter and the kinetics, you will have a slower rise in the extracellular dopamine concentration. And that is a completely different effect uh, on the plasticity and, and, and how the brain perceives uh, the effect of the drug. What I'm going to do now is actually switch a little bit because this transporter uh, is also very important in disease. I will show you something that illustrates how important it is and I think it's also relevant for the perspective of, of addiction. Um, why does it work these movies? Something wrong. Check this. It does. I guess I have to skip the movies here uh, because one of the questions that was first published by a group in the UK what happens if you don't have this important target for, for drugs like cocaine and amphetamine? Well, if you actually develop a severe motoric dysfunction, infantile Parkinson within the first six months after you're, uh, you're born. This is under, underscoring the importance of, of dopamine for its role in controlling our locomotor activity. And these kids actually, the main problem is actually they end up lacking dopamine. They have a lack of dopamine because then they cannot maintain the pool and eventually they die. Um, an increasing number of mutations have now been described to cause what we call dopamine transporter deficiency syndrome, uh, most of them causing uh, ER retention, and it's a recessive disorder, you need a mutation of HLL, but this causes this very, very severe disease. Interestingly, at the other end of kind of this disease spectrum, single mutations have in the transporter has been connected to neuropsychiatric diseases like autism and ADHD, suggesting that if you have change of function or smaller changes in the function of this protein, you might have a higher risk of developing a, um, a, a neuropsychiatric disease, whereas if you absolutely have no transporter, your main problem is actually relating to the uh, locomotor function or regulation of locomotor function mediated by, by dopamine. One thing that's really interesting in this context is, is that we have identified patients that are kind of bridging this spectrum of diseases, which again uh, suggests the different functions of, of dopamine in our brain. And what I'm going to just briefly touch upon is a patient who has, who has two mutations, one on each LL in a dopamine transporter, and it has an atypical uh, dopamine deficiency syndrome. And again, you cannot see the movie, but he is now 47 years old, and his in his childhood, he developed his significant welfare problems and he couldn't uh, main, uh, focus on anything. He had clearly ADHD. At that time, he didn't have that diagnosis. And later, in his 20s, he then developed his Parkinsonism. So here you have a combination of the psychiatric disease, neuropsychiatric disease, and, uh, uh, and, and, and lo locomotor dysfunction. Uh, and he has these two mutations uh, in the transporter, and it underlines this, this spectrum of, the, uh, of, of diseases that you can cause. 
the way we then work on this is also very translational because we're trying to go all the way from analyzing these mutations uh, at the molecular level in cells uh, and then also generating mouse models, uh, uh, screening for new mutations. Uh, and this is just one example where you can look, just look at a simple dopamine uptake experiment. Uh, you have the wild type uh, transporter there. You have uh, the two mutations, one of them more inefficient than the other one. And here you have something that would probably be what you will find in, in the patient, which is some activity. And this may actually explain why he doesn't develop his disease in, in, in early infancy, but only later, because he has some activity, but eventually that becomes a problem. But nevertheless, the dysfunction caused by the changed function of the dopamine transport is sufficient to cause uh, neuropsychiatric disease in, 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 in childhood. Um, you can also, one of the way we, we, you can go now into the mechanism, we can study in detail and study the structure of the protein, really understand how uh, these mutations might cause disease. For example, one interesting thing is uh, if you this, uh, look at the, uh, one of the mutations in, in this person, in this patient, is actually uh, perturbing sodium binding uh, to the transporter, and it's a sodium coupled transporter, so evidently uh, this is a major problem uh, and resulting in this dysfunctional transport protein. It also has other functions as it leaks dopamine in the wrong direction and has different leak currents. Uh, but nevertheless, this is how we try to work with this, trying to dissect the molecular mechanism. Uh, and then finally also develop new disease models like knock in mice and hoping that this, these efforts uh, will lead to more understanding of dopamine disease biology, addiction, uh, and hopefully also new treatments. Uh, and with those words, I will actually end, and I'm ready to take any questions. So if anybody's got a question, please do come forward or edge away from the microphone. Someone had their hand up over here, I believe. <laughs> okay, well listen, I'd quite like to start off because, so quite different presentations on quite different subjects, or seemingly to me as a, a layperson here. So are there any big overlaps between understanding molecular level dopamine in the brain and, and Christian with what you're doing. Yeah, I, I definitely believe. I mean, the, the work uh, that uh, you just presented, Ulrich, about the uh, dopamine transporter knockout is actually very important for us because it has been used as a model. There was a publication in 98 to understand the mechanism of action of cocaine. And uh, the uh, difficulty was that there were adaptive changes and also the fact that to some extent these monomine transporters can substitute for each other, such that some of the initial conclusions that were drawn on these uh, global dopamine transporter knockouts are today have to, have to be refined. And what you're showing here with the knock-in mice of the dopamine transporter, there is this one that is a dopamine transporter knock-in that is insensitive for cocaine. So it transports dopamine normally, but it no longer binds cocaine. And that actually is a very good model to study the pharmacological effects with little if interference. So to see what is going on in humans with a deficient dopamine transporter seven, certainly has a very strong bearing on the research that we do. Well, yes, indeed. I think there's a lot of relevance. and, and uh, Now I mention this because I wanted to emphasize, or describe this because I emphasize the importance of the target for these drugs and how changes in the function actually contribute to disease and I think we can learn a lot from that also in terms of, uh, of, of addiction. Um, and, and I think that that bridges well to more integrated work that was presented by, by you, uh, uh, Christian. So I, I think this, it kind of, the spectrum it makes a lot of sense in terms of understanding mechanism. Any questions from the floor? Do we have any questions? Well, I might ask actually, um, so 
both of you have been showing us lovely pictures of rats. Are we close? To, are we looking at this in humans already? Are we close to that? We actually we work only with mice, not oh, with men. <laughs> precisely for the reason of the genetic models. Uh, it's still a long shot from a mouse to a human being, and I guess one has to realize that drug addiction is an extremely complex syndrome that has many different symptoms. And in rodents, you can maybe uh, mimic and model some of the core components, but you're never going to get the full picture. So this is, I think, just a reality, but of course it's offset by the power of the molecular and genetic investigation that we can make. But clearly, I think, in the sort of the path towards translation, we definitely will have to have a step where we do non-human primates. I guess that's a really important thing, and particularly for the, the DPS, the deep brain stimulation part, where already the initial discovery, now 25 years ago, was really crucially relying on the work in non-human primates. I think translation, yes, but we need to get through this different step because eventually what we try to do is to interfere with circuits of motivated behavior and we need to study this in a brain that is closer to humans. Uh, I completely agree, and, and but, but if we're not talking addiction, but, but more general dopamine diseases, some of these, if you take patient mutations, you, you have real true translation from mouse models to humans because you can, uh, and, and then you can study the mouse models in many, many more details compared to, to a human being. And you can, so, so I think that's an important translational component. And of course, but of course, with certain things, you, you might do studies in, in, in non human primates as well. Uh, but there are certain studies that are very difficult to do in primates because it's very it's very expensive and there's ethical issues. Uh, and then mice uh, are still, for to some extent, a, a usable model, uh, especially because of all the mouse genetics that's available. And you also use the optogenetics, and we also engage in optogenetics and chemogenetic methods uh, in, in in our lab. I didn't show that, but we. Uh, doing that as well. And uh, just thinking about kind of broader um, applications, I guess, this isn't only related to cocaine. I mean, you showed a couple of other substances. Is it also for um, habits as well, behavior? Yeah, so we, I mean, my lab has never really been interested in cocaine. We want to understand the commonalities of addictive drugs. Sure, uh, by, uh, you know, we know that if you take heroin or cocaine, the experience is very different, but they share that common property that they can induce addiction. So we wanted to understand what the common thing is. And I think what really convinced me is, is that the possibility to, with optogenetic self-stimulation of the VTA dopamine neurons and selectively the VTA dopamine neurons, not to the nigris, you can actually go beyond reinforcement. So I've shown you in the video that this is strongly reinforcing, but we have all the drug adaptive behavior. We have it also with self-stimulation of VTA dopamine neurons. So that, as such, demonstrates the sufficiency of that system to induce even late stage uh, models of the disease. Um, yes, in, in, indeed, and, and our interest in what well, we actually have been specifically interested in cocaine and related compounds, especially to understand how different drugs or different drugs targeting a protein like the dopamine transporter can actually result in very different effects, have different stimulatory effects, and whether that actually can be used for treatment of uh, of addiction uh, as well. So, so it's, but but indeed, you have the convergence in, in terms of me mechanisms. Uh, but but we, we have had a lot of focus on the drugs themselves. Any last attempt for a question? I should say for people watching online, there's actually quite a lot of people here. It doesn't, <laughs> it might not come through on the video, Turn which is only looking at us. <laughs> but they're all so shy. No, 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 okay. Well, listen, in that case, I'm just going to say thanks to both of you for coming and talking and for preparing presentations at really quite a last minute. That was great. So thanks very much.
back here tomorrow at 12.15, so do come back for that for the poster pictures and sign up if you haven't done so already. Thanks a lot. Bye. So we have a